just set up. Oh, there lovely. we are. Oh, okay. Hey. Okay. We had to cut off the messy conversation so we could begin the actual thing. Anyway. Oh, honey, it's still gonna be messy, so. It's still good, okay, okay. We're all here for some mess. Hi, everybody who's showing up already here. We'll, we're gonna start with the introduction in a moment. In the meantime, you have lovely Sydney being our Wizard of Oz in the background, making sure everything's running smoothly. And we have Yona here with Angela Bassett arms. And we have Vanessa here, making sure everybody's getting the right message and the right healing going for themselves. That's all of us. <laughs> it has to be correct somehow. All um, of us. All of us are doing it. What's that image in the background, Vanessa? Uh, Vanessa? Oh, that's one of my mother's quilts. <laughs> yes. She painted it? My mother was, my mother died six years ago. And I realized with, you know, as her death becomes a longer time, her absence becomes longer in my presence, how much information there is in every stitch and every choice of her quilts. And it, it is mm -hmm. like my mother left me, um, you know how they talk about the secret library that lives underneath the pyramids in Giza? They say yes. that there's a archive of all human history. It's like my mother left me um, an ever-expanding universal archive in the information of her quilts, and I'm really humbled by them. So this is my steady Zoom background. It's one of my mother's. <laughs> I love it. That's funny yeah. because my Zoom background is like a quilt. It's like a quilt my mother crocheted for me. So wow. when I was leaving for college, she was like, I made, I've been making this for you like steadily over time. So she crocheted for me and I just take it everywhere with me. And yes. I have to, it's like, you know how kids carry blankets around? That's like still what it is for me. Like I have to have it. Yeah, we, the world would be a safer place if adults would carry their security blankets around too. Uh, yeah. I believe that. I mean, entirely <laughs> seriously, like carry your talismans of safety with you to reassure you. Trump carried his baby blanket. I would be fine if Mitch McConnell carried, you know, the onesie that his great grandmother lovingly crocheted for him to keep him, <laughs> you know, deeply connected yeah. to be, stay in connection. Uh, we would all be better off if you saw board meetings where people drag, drag their blankies into the room. <laughs> right, right. Or even like with the Zoom phenomena happening now, everybody's saying Skype missed this opportunity. People actually going to work meetings with their cats or with their dogs mm -hmm. as like support and people encouraging it because it also comforts them. Yeah, yeah it's interesting how isolation reminds you of the tenderness of your humanity and the fragility mm -hmm. and the, you know, the constant urgency of 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 that tenderness and being in connection with it so right. and i'm not i'm not surprised by the ways that human beings are expressing an awakening to uh their own earthliness and to the deep needs of their humanity to the when i say the deep needs of your humanity of course you would be in relationship with a cat of course you would be in relationship in conscious intentional relationship with your animals in conscious intention intentional relationship with your um, human need to have tenderness and to be comforted and that that is not weakness, but it is integral to um, your thriving humanity. That's not a surprise to me. I refuse to mock people who are reaching deeply into their places of innate humanness. And I refuse to mock, I, I refuse it. I refuse, I'm, I'm glad for it. Always bring your animals. Bring, bring that sharing and that tenderness into all of the spaces that we normally reserve for rigidity and systemic, um, you know, uh, like systemic obligation, the obligation that the system puts on your um, sort of quote unquote maturity. I'm here for it. Oh, right. It's a wise, it's a wise refusal. So we're at 1201. We're going to get started with the introduction. Um, hello, Augustonians. Welcome to the inaugural Lit Friday. Lit Friday is a monthly digital event from the August Wilson African American Cultural Center. And on the fourth Friday of every month, hence fourth, we'll be inviting black artists from across disciplines and professions into conversations with one another and myself. My name is Jessica Lene. I'm an art writer and poet. 
I have the privilege of being the literary curator for this event and the amazing privilege of being in conversation with Yona Harvey and Vanessa German, both of who are poets and artists. They are creators who have definitely had a huge impact on me as a writer. I am one of Yona's continuing through reading her writing and former students at University of Pittsburgh. And I interviewed Vanessa German for Bomb Magazine about two years ago. And for me, that wasn't just an interview, it changed the way I advocated for myself as, um, as a writer and as a poet, most definitely. Um, I'm gonna do bios now. Yona Harvey is an American poet and recipient of the Kate Tufts Disco Discovery Award for her first poetry collection, Hemming the Water. Her second poetry collection, yay! You Don't Have to Go to Mars for Love is forthcoming in September, 2020. We're all just waiting so much. Um, she is among the first black women to write for Marvel Comics since the company's founding in 1939 and the first black woman to write for the Marvel character Storm. She facilitates creative writing workshops, delivers writing specific speaker topics, and has worked with teenagers writing about mental health issues in collaboration with Creative Nonfiction Magazine. Her website is yonaharvey.com for more information and updates on all of the wonderful things she's giving us in the world. Vanessa German is an award-winning multidisciplinary artist based in the Homewood community of PA. Vanessa creates contemporary power figures as she defines them, made of everyday objects transformed into iconography of astonishing metaphors. Vanessa believes her power figures are alive by sight and the adventure that sight incites in every piece has its own meaning. Vanessa has pioneered a performance style called spoken word opera, which brings all of the drama and theatricality of traditional opera to intimate performances and contemporary themes through a dynamic hybrid of spoken word poetry, hip hop, storytelling, music, and movement. To see Vanessa's sculptural work, please visit Pavel Zubuk, and that's P-A-V-E-L, Z-O-U-B-O-K.com, pavelzubuk.com, or conceptartgallery.com. And those are also the galleries that represent her in New York and Pittsburgh. I also wanna give a shout out and a thank you to Disha Filia for curating them in the inaugural Lit Friday programming. The genius, amazing idea. Um, so thank you, Disha. Uh, to Disha. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we begin, I think it is important for us to take a collective breath for those of us who are protesting around the country and in Minneapolis against anti-Black violence. Um, and I think we should all share a collective breath for the home going of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, Monica Diamond, and Nina Pop, and all the others who've had, we've had to say goodbye to. So let's close our eyes and begin inhaling. And hold and slowly exhale. Thank you to everybody who shared a breath with us. It's important for us to send out as much of our good energy that we have within us um, when we can't stand in physical power. So now, it's time for Yona and Vanessa to take it away. They're gonna share their amazing work with us and then the conversation will begin. Okay. You guys can decide who goes first. <laughs> Do you have a feeling about it, Yona? I don't have a feeling, I'm open. Okay. Um, I don't, no, no. You don't? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll start with my mess then since you're gonna read. Ooh. Ooh. Familiar, like, familiar things. <laughs> I'm so excited, Yona! <laughs> Thank y'all for showing up. It's good to be here with y'all. I'm loving it. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to read two pieces. And I like, I say messy in a loving way, not as an excuse or whatever. So... They both come out of one, the first one comes out of my writing group and the second one comes out of a class that I taught this past spring with undergraduates at Pitt. So, and they both kind of 
connected to automatic writing where you just go inside it mm. whatever happens happens you don't so i haven't really messed with them that much all right so the first one is absurdity with orange robes in springtime mm. and this is after or with my writing group i said i want to see you at the gates of the Fushimi Inari Shrine in Kyoto, lit with the wonder, the color of monks' robes and holy gates and sunsets and birds of paradise, rivaled only by lavender sprigs or the spectacle of sunsets on the Pittsburgh, on the Pittsburgh north side. Except I didn't say exactly that I wanted to see you, only that I would go as we slipped into some realm I'm hesitant to define. I didn't say today's soundtrack made sense when I listened to each track carefully and pushed past the residue of human fear, the fog of mistakes I'd rather not shuffle or repeat. May I return to the innocence of first dances, the ones where I wasn't self-conscious or nervous, just glad to be moving and sweating a little. Maybe I'll hold still in the memory of kinetic flow, the way I stood once between two trains running on a Fukuoka platform in opposite directions. What proof do I have I was ever there that I'm brave enough to return, stride strong and smooth as warm house sake or an elephant pressing dust track on a road? Mm. Am I allowed to speak of the biodynamics of black socks slipped on in a hurry or miso soup losing steam or the heart's chemistry reconfiguring itself on a dissonant scale? Don't mistake my speaking for blues. It's more like death of the sourpuss, death of the fearful, more like a forester sneaking off by herself just for a minute away from the control team or central emotional command, moving toward the absurdity of midweek drunkenness, toward the first awkward steps of an ancient dance near the foot of an oak tree or some such spectacle, if I'm allowed. Okay. <laughs> and then the second one, I, I don't usually write with my classes, it's funny, like my writing group and the class because of COVID was on Zoom, obviously. And I just have to say in both of the instances when these pieces came out, they were good Zoom sessions. It was a very loving kind of Zen moment both mm -hmm. times. So this one is called The Color Purple and it's after Alice Walker and my spring poetry writing class, undergraduate class. And also the, the TA for that class was Gray Eden and she brought in the workshop that we did to close out the class that day. Okay. And essentially, if you wanna do this exercise, she asked us to think about a book that was important to us in our lives and then maybe riff off of that book or that feeling or that writer. The Color Purple. You can plant an entire yard, even if your yard even if your entire yard equals a corner window in an apartment or 20 square or 20 square feet of dirt in the front of an out of the way bungalow. Hyacinth, tulip, iris, hydrangea, lavender, echinacea, clematis crystal fountain, clematis stand by me, campanula, butterfly bush or budlia, purple haze, baptisia, australis, baptisia, sparkling sapphire, Aster purple dome. You can wear yourself out reciting the names of things, but there is something to be said of silent admiration, quiet acknowledgement, the way nature shocks us into just standing there, breathing the fragrance, the lavender fog flooding the eyes, and you are not pissing off God. You are nodding to Cora, Annie, Step, Turk, I mean, Albert, Catherine, Thelma, Gene Geneva, Maddie, all those new world names when Africa was lost, all when West Africa was lost, 
all those resiliences, leathered hands in the dirt or pricked by cotton seeds or slapped back for fear of a worse reprimand in search of the gardens our mothers planted and nourished us from. Tomatoes, greens, as common as a Saturday in July on Bodmin Street, a lilac repeating in the pattern of an Easter dress, one God becoming the receptacle of another in order to keep the spirit of belief, a mass planting soothes. There is salve in salvation or the way we have shaped it, the lost God in the depth of perception, the fine line between lavender and blue. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thanks to my class. <laughs> So, Yona, what's it like for you to um, read those that you haven't, you know, revisited? What's happened? What can you share some of the dimensions of that experience? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, it's new, but I, I feel like I'm in this place where it feels okay to be messy and not be perfect. I think there is a pressure. I mean, for people who don't know me who are watching, I, I teach at Pitt and I think there's this pressure to know everything, say everything right, do, do everything well. And I just really have to resist that on a daily basis for my own, on a daily basis for my own sanity. So to read it feels good. Like I'm in this transitionary, transitional period where that's, that's where I'm at. And I'm in, I want to encourage other people to do that too, because as long as you are trying to read the most perfect things and be the most perfect self, you ain't going to make nothing. <laughs> so it feels good. It feels, I'm celebrating that. It actually feels good. I think two months ago, six months ago, I would have said it feels horrible. I wouldn't have even done it. Ooh. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that there's something about our current moment that's kind of pushed that forward for you, Yona? Um, or has contributed to it in, 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 re in regards to like the isolation, self-sheltering? Yes. Yeah. I'm working with some great groups, just, <laughs> you know, so a great groups of women, a group of Black women mothers in Pittsburgh, um, and then also a group of women from around the world and this is this is the work that we're doing so yeah I think the moment has definitely influenced that like the silences the people working on themselves the people reaching out to their tribe like who's going to support you who's going to help you be brave in a public space and not hide yeah great question thank you do you recognize those works as works of courage? God, yes. Yeah, girl, you don't, I don't write anything close to love poems or I like you poems. I definitely don't be putting that out in the public space. So yes. And then I don't typically write with my students because I'm usually so distracted by making sure they're okay and not mm -hmm. to show them some, some unfinished stuff. So yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I love the space of, um, you know, one of the other, one of the works from other writers that I wanted to read was from Sadia Hartman's mm -hmm. uh, Wayward Lies, Beautiful Experiments. And I love in the intro of the book where it's about experimenting with freedom and how one of the things that you opened with us is your experiments into the freedom of process for yourself. Yeah. And, um, and then to experience you experiencing the gifts of that experiment and recognizing, because it sounds like when you talk about what you would not have done six months ago, you know, it's a little painful mm -hmm. to say, like, I, I, I wouldn't have shared this. I wouldn't have let it be seen. I wouldn't have, to be a Black woman of a certain age and to say, I'm not going to write or share about a love poem or what I like and knowing, mm -hmm. um, knowing sort of, 
honestly what we know about professional black women and singlehood, you know, and to not share, uh, to not share our likes, our wants, our desires. And so that's something that I really loved in that first poem that you read where you start saying, may I do this? Mm -hmm. May I see? Can I say, but I'm not gonna say that I want. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so that is, um, you know, personally for me, I want you to have all of the love. <laughs> I want you to have, you know, all of the Kyoto moments on train tracks, all of the romance, all of the bravery, all of the eruptions through uh, the walls of the old ways that you said, I would not ever have done this. And to keep seeing and finding yourself anew because I can't tell you how much permission that gives to my heart, you know, to my brave heart, to my cowardly heart, to think about the things that I would not do and I would not say. And a lot of times, like, where did they come from for you? Were those your own rules? Yeah, I think when I, I mean, I, they come a little bit from <laughs> feeling punished for what I would say. As, I was gonna as say it. punishment. Yeah, yeah, as a child. Uh, as a professional, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. some so people, you, don't, people don't like, like to hear <laughs> truthful things, <laughs> even if they're not even connected to them, you know what I mean? So just thinking about not protection. I felt like in the past I was sheltering or turtling mm. my from reprimand, punishment, whatever those consequences would, would be. And that's partially true. But more recently, I had to think about, oh, you know, I think I'm, I was also holding back, not wanting to like release what I feel. So mm -hmm. that's more on me. So when I think about that, I'm like, well, whatever, you might not like it. You might not like me back or whatever, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just release what I have right here, you know, and I and feel also, better. <laughs> and also in reference to Hartman's book, there's also this return in those narratives to this like core of determination. Mm -hmm. Like each of the photographs she analyzes awakens a narrative about, you know, women mm -hmm. who are refusing to be told anymore. Black women yeah. who are refusing to be told regardless of the risk of that residue of punishment that we all carry on us as far as like, don't desire, you'll be told no. Don't mm -hmm. be this way, you won't be desired back or wanted. Or right. even just living wildly and, and just craving experience when you've been forced via society into this kind of very monochrome existence and you just become determined to say, I'm gonna look at whatever I want and process that with the bravery that's available to me and allow myself my process, no matter how that looks. Mm -hmm. And that especially yeah. stood out for me in the second poem, this kind of like naming on flowers as these like objects of, you know, incredible vulnerability and how they grow and develop from bulbs, but how they each represent their own like fantastical desire, this very sensual experience and taste. You know, some of those flowers you can cook things with, make perfume with, they can cover mm -hmm. a world, you know? Right. So it's like, so, yeah. you know. And then, I mean, I, yeah. There's also I'm, this sense that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Vanessa. I'll just say it really quickly. I'm working in the garden now. Um, and so the way that you talked about nature shocking us mm. into being and smelling and looking and connecting and the, just the pre the rich, substantial um, sort of verdant presence of nature in yeah. both of those works and our earthliness in relationship with them was, is so, um, that really gave me the trembles for where I am right now. Vanessa, a question just came through for you. It okay. did. It did, it did. <laughs> From the cloud, it just rains out. <laughs> um, it's from our audience, and I, you know, we'd like to share these. So, the question is for Vanessa: the piece you wrote on Facebook today used trees as repositories and embodiment for the human story. Can you share a little more about your choice of trees to carry it onward? 
Um, I don't know if they're talking about the specific trees or the idea of placing the deep responsibility of true remembering into nature. So specific trees, um, some of the trees I mentioned, bristlecone pines are the oldest trees on the planet Earth. They're so old, they clone themselves. Mm. So these are trees that are 5,000, 6,000 years old. And when you have um, an earthling conscious organism that has um, existed on this planet for all that time, um, one can enter into the sort of vast space of what that organism remembers, right? Mm -hmm. And then what if we, because we, one of the things that that writing says, um, so also to reference, since the um, stay at home order and the pandemic was declared, I have been writing these dispatches from the future where I throw my consciousness into um, a future that's a hundred years, a thousand years, five years, 50 years. And I place myself as a remember sometimes into um, an artificial intelligence and sometimes um, into the layered consciousness of nature that my physical body isn't there, but in my consciousness, I'm looking back in time and I'm saying, I have had to keep these stories. And this is the way that we as human beings um, created a fail-safe way of, of um, keeping our rememberings present in the now time. So I write these dispatches from the future. And one of the things I have been thinking about in that, I, in that way of looking, you know, of ancient future, of looking back, is to say, how were we able to keep our stories and how are we able to keep our stories straight, right? Mm -hmm. how story straight. Human beings cannot be trusted to keep a story straight. <laughs> so there's this idea that we, um, because so in some of the research I, I do around quantum physics and um, consciousness and the expanding universe, there's this idea that your the human beings came into intentional relationship with the consciousness of plants before you entered human form. And mm -hmm. you agreements with certain plants. So I think about all of the plants that Yona listed um, and that there might have been um, a past time where those plants in Yona's poetic consciousness agreed to be in relationship. So the idea is that through this conscious relationship, we build a bridge through innate human technologies and through spiritual technologies um, and through the technology of the soul to be in relationship with these trees enough that we had them to hold our true human story so that by breathing the air, eating food, by plant touching the dirt, mm -hmm. that, your, that the remembering is so thoroughly, um, is so thoroughly effervescent and ensconced in, in, in the earth and in all natural parts of the earth that we are never in a state of having forgotten, that we begin to live such humble, grounded, rooted lives because the past is never past. Our now uh, surrounds us with this infinite type of information that never bogs us down. It just becomes a part of our wholeness. And that is present to me as a, you know, just my friends in Minneapolis started to send me videos and photos like at midnight, three or four days ago. And I didn't look at them because I was like, yo, I've been there. I've been on freeways. I've had, I've been at Standing Rock, M16s pointed to your head from men who were 25 years old and left work, kissed their babies and came to hold an M16 against my head on a bridge, you know? So I've been, I've put my body in all these places and I had to, for my own sanity, for look, my daily survival, I had to leap into a future where I could see that we held our stories in a way that was so radically different that we could exist more wholly in our humanity because our humanity is so cramped, is mm -hmm. so constrained right now. So that's a really long answer to what that person said. The specific trees I mentioned, some of them are the oldest trees. Some of them are the largest trees, and some of them are trees that have, uh, we thought that some of them were extinct because of the blight that human interaction in the earth caused the trees. Mm -hmm. So those are the remembering trees. Mm -hmm.
or even like, like, or thinking of like memory as witness too, right? So it's like the way that you imprint on things around you and they imprint back on you. This idea that, you know, like there's a physiological patterning that happens with every interaction. And so you pass it along in your blood, you pass it along to the things you touch and you plant. And I think the agreement you're talking about that also occurs in Yona's second poem still exists in that way, like most definitely, like I agree. It's like when we're gone and those bristle cone, pine cone trees are still there, they'll have evidences of us that they'll continue passing on. And it's a kind of witnessing that should make important how and what you do with others. It makes it much more important to have love be reproduced in those things that will be here, but carry imprints of us in the future. Yes. Are we ready for the second reader? Are we ready, Vanessa? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share uh, a portion of a poem that I wrote, that I perform a lot. Uh, I wrote it maybe 15 years ago, and it is still really powerful to me. It's really powerful me for me to perform, and it is continually showing me things, um, which is why I love your response to Yona rereading these works that you called messy, but also said you didn't mess with. So I thought <laughs> on what they're giving you and how they're alive for you right now. So I'm going to share some of this work and then I'd love it if anybody would ask me questions about it so that I don't have to just tell you all of the things I've been thinking, because maybe you'll have a question that will really inspire me. Uh, so um, I begin with this uh, sound poem. Baba way, Baba way, Baba way, Baba way. If my hands were anything other than hands, they would be two shooting stars galloping light across the galaxy. They would be a twin fandango of diamond-studded fingerprints hopscotching, a radiant neon merengue of light from each folded velvet edge of midnight into every tidy galaxy of 14 carat suns. My shooting star hands would reach and leap and turn the faces of every burning celestial pedestrian star grazed and gazing, bright-eyed, amazed, and awestruck as my shooting star hands grip by in a flurry of pirouette spitting sparks and spilling light like each finger is a silver big flip light of flicking flames of hope into the open faces of those twinkling pale and incandescent sisters whose tears glisten and litter the blistering avenue like sequence i say now can you see it how my shooting star hands would wow and bow them right out of their everyday orbits, turn their glowing dashboard Virgin Mary faces into an illuminated orchestra of rubies and gladiolas right before your very eyes. If my hands were anything other than hands, they would be a street corner jazz quintet. They would be a 10 fingered symphony of saxophones, trombones, clarinets and trumpets wailing, rowdy, loud and proud right out from under my fingernails, the song would swell and swing. It would ring from lap posts. It would bail and it would reach into people's houses. It would bring mothers and sons come to dance jubilee in the middle of the street with fathers and daughters. We would be all song and dance and celebration just the way we are supposed to be if my hands were anything other than hands. If they were a street corner jazz quintet, maybe there would be no vicious, evil, cruel death stomping on the neck, brothers, death on the avenue. If my fingers came, if they saw these vicious cruelties labeled and lingered into the bodies of my brothers and my sisters, I would just send my fingers flying in a furious hurricane of eighth notes to slap right into the faces of any slick tongue gun toting mamma jamma who come to do whatever he wants my fingers would fly right into the faces of those slick tongue gun toting mamma jammas and it would seize them in their tracks and we would be so much gooder so much better than ever before if my hands were anything other than hands <laughs> thanks yeah. thank you thank you thank you 
I liked reading that on a video store, right? <laughs> Yes! <laughs> woo, woo! I got the fire up in my body. I am like a rocket ship no one could design, but my soul, my soul, my soul, you know. All right. Questions? Yes. Y'all yes. know what you got for me? Well, first of all, I have to acknowledge that you are still learning from a poem that you wrote 15 years ago. You know? True. Like True. a lot of poets or singers, whoever, like there's always this pressure to like show something new. Can you talk about the, you know, the instructions from work, a work that's 15 years old? What has this work been teaching you? Okay, so one, we know through physics that all time exists in a single plane, <laughs> right? So it's like a skirt. You Sometimes you on the hem, sometimes you in the fold, sometimes you in the pocket. Sometimes you can turn the skirt around, pull it up to your breast, and it's a dress. You know, so time is, um, the time does whatever it wants. So the 15 years thing is, um, that's one thing. So what I will say is, I dreamt the line of that poem. I had never dreamt a line of a poem before and remembered it. But I was, I had a dream where I became a fanatic of a single line, which is if my hands were anything other than hands, if my hands were anything other than hands. Mm -hmm. And that dream came probably two years after I had a period of like a 17 day period where I was hearing the like in physical um, now time where I would hear in my ears, people whispering poems to me, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, people, some people might think is psychotic. I personally think war is psychotic. Um, so I would hear these poems in my ear and I learned through that the value of silence to get quiet, right? And so there was this period of time where I started to pay more attention to levels of power that existed inside of poetry. So I had this dream and I just keep repeating over and over in the dream if my hands were anything other than hands, if my hands were anything other than hands. I woke up, I began to write. That writing, Yona, do you ever feel, do you ever have moments of writing that are so pure and in the line of uh, where your um, sort of like what what they call flow, like when it's your body, your brain, your spiritual process, your political cultural process, and they all come in into a real fine frequency with very little static. So I had writing like that, writing that was so powerful, nine or ten hours would pass, and I would feel so refreshed mm -hmm. and. So in that poem, one of the things that, uh, one of the ways I am still learning from it is similar to the space of releasing anxiety, releasing any externally speared pressures upon my process and mm -hmm. upon what might be a product of a process and to live dimensionally fully in a moment of creativity and to protect that space. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I read that poem and when I perform that poem, I am able to, so you mentioned earlier the phrase automatic writing. So automatic writing and the history of automatic writing, part of that, uh, part of the way that poets and mystics and part of the way that that's talked about is a form of channeling. And sometimes mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not channeling like this extra dimensional spirit, you're channeling yourself. Mm -hmm. You're channeling a pure frequency of uninterrupted cre creativity that is a stream from your own soul. And you can, it can be thrown around through time because we talked a little about time being, you know, it's just off here. So you could throw a poem up from your childhood. You could throw, throw a poem down from when you're 97 years old, you know, and you can catch it. I think about that. And so inside of performing that poem, it allows me to enter into a frequency of my um, sort of dimensional humanity, political, spiritual, cultural self, where I can love so deeply through the rhythms and sounds that I placed in relationship with each other inside of that poem and I can transcend 
into uh, a level of active creativity through reading a poem that I wrote 15 years ago that allows, that fuels the well of future creativity, but it also gives me the opportunity to attend to issues of my soul in the sound of the poem. I'm always doing two different things when I read that poem. I make an internal decision about the medicine that I need the poem to give me, the mm. medicine that I need my soul, to, my soul, my breath to give me. And then I'm also, for anybody who hears it for the first time, they're hearing this work. They're hearing this operatic, dramatic work and they get to have that own experience. But I also embed so much secret root inside of the relationships between the words and the rhythm in the poem. And so I can direct that intentionally whenever I read it. And, and as an artist, and like as I've gotten more um, sort of visibility as an artist, one of the things that I really struggled with is what you said earlier is with like a professional, mature, you know, mm -hmm. successful artist doesn't do this, they don't do that, they don't do this, they don't do that, they don't do this. Mm -hmm. And that poem allows me to sometimes see the obstacles that I've built for myself yeah. in turn. And it actually never gets old. It never gets old unless I punish myself by thinking I owe people anything other than the truth. Yeah, you could you could really hear that and feel that in the poem. You can completely embody it in this moment, right? And there's also these leaps. So there's starting with the hands, if my hands, hands are usually these tactile things we connect that are connected to our bodies, but in yours, they're moving into this galactical, celestial space, right? And then they're moving into music and sound and community space. And then they're transcending, transcending a kind of violence and cruelty. That's just, it's a sliver of it. You mentioned it really, really quickly, but you know, you acknowledge that it's there. All of these things that if the hands were not hands that they could do. So you really hear that. Yeah, the, the homo galacticus. Of, <laughs> right? Yes. I mean, so we have, um, it is, um, it was, thank you for that reflection, Yona. Thank you for hearing that and reflecting it that back to me. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I want to ask you later. I think there's a question, but so maybe there's not a now, comment but... and a question, oh, but you're okay. welcome to ask, ask, ask whatever you'd like. The comments for you, Yona, from Ashana Porter. Oh, okay. Yona, you once told me that you loved one of my poems and your words have sustained me through some terrible attacks of self-doubt. Thank you. Mm. You're welcome. And there's a question for Vanessa. The way in which you list the media materials for your work is such powerful poetry. Have you always woven poetry into your visual art practice? Did one come before and form the other or have they always existed simultaneously? Well, so a lot of my art practice uh, really took flight at a really difficult ledge, which was the ledge of me saying, I will either die, I will either end my own life as opposed to um, seeding the lie of a certain type of uh, American success, uh, whatever it is to be s successful in the tropes of uh, sort of mainstream America. And so because I had this literal uh, not literal, because I set myself like a time to stay alive and to experiment with the freedom of my own creativity inside of this six month experiment that I did to see if I could save my own life by making art every day. What I learned in that, um, what I learned in that sort of ecosystem that I created for myself to create in is that um, I get to decide. I get to decide what really matters in this process. I get to decide uh, how I identify the dimensions that are present. And so when I list the materials for my sculpture, I'm, I'm listing important experiences that I had when I was creating that sculpture. I'll say, you know, wood, tar, hair grease, old weave hair, fabric, that one time that we 
found Mr. Jeff's body outside at 5 a.m. The way that my arms kept flying up to my head and the 911 operator said, ma'am, you need to calm down and stop screaming. I had to tell her, it's not me who is screaming, wood, nails, you know? And so there is a way that it was important for me um, to sort of come outside of uh, a lot of the sort of constraints of the way that we talk about contemporary art and what goes into contemporary art to say that this is a dimensional process. This is a conceptual process. It is an intellectual process, but it's also a spiritual process. It's a process of heart. It's a process of memory. And then to put all of the, as much of that information visibly into my material list also as a reckoning for other human beings who might think like, you don't say what happened to you when you were making a sculpture, that's not important. But if it's important to you, uh, maybe you'll be inspired to begin to include dimensional ingredients into uh, how you, in, into sort of sharing your materials for that. But also what it allows me to do is perform my sculptural work. So if I am in a museum, I can perform the actual materials that are in the work, some that you can see, some that you cannot see. And that performance is a ritual that activates the power of the power figures. Can you talk about that a little bit more, performing your sculptural work? I don't think many people would make that connection. You know, Can you talk about how that came to be? Yes, well, I'll first talk about it by saying that I love Africa and that, um, and when all of the African people in the world are respected, Black people around the world will be respected. And so I say that as a descendant of enslaved Africans. I say that as a people who always performed their sculptural work. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a descendant of African people um, who performed ritual with masks, who performed rituals totally adorned from head to toe and beyond in the uh, sort of grass skirts that look like they're floating around. You're performing, uh, you're, this is a dimensional performance. So I come from people who uh, put spiritual bodies into physical bodies to do both spiritual and physical work. It, this is ancient human technology, right? It is ancient human technology. People perform the work of objects every time you cook, every time you pick up a spoon, and you are performing that object. What happens when you start to do that with dimensional intention. What happens when you pick up the spoon and you know you are spoon feeding your baby, but what happens if you really acknowledge it as uh, the truest form of brave loving that there is? What mm -hmm. happens to that experience? So for me, um, love is the critical engine of my life and performing the work means that I am a lot of times in spaces that have been really exclusive and sometimes violent to people of color in museums and in different academic institutions. And so that performance is a, is a performance of love. It is a ritual of love. It is a reckoning of love. It is a reckoning of our earthliness. It is a reckoning of, of um, recognizing that we have so much to heal from. Every human being around us, we have so much to heal from. So when I'm performing that work in a space, sometimes it'll be on a walkthrough in a museum with a tour of people and I will stop by a work and I will um, perform the work. I will say, sometimes I'll say the title of the work. I say, this work is called, Sometimes I Want to Kill You. It is made of wood and hair grease. And the one time that my mother had to go down to the liquor store and threaten that man who told us he can, we can, uh, he called us the N word and couldn't come back again. Uh, this work is made of, you know, the, yeah. all the wood that I found in the abandoned lots in my neighborhood. And then I'll do that. And when I'm really brave, I never close my eyes. And I look at people the entire time. And uh, sometimes I think that it's shocking. I think that it can take people out of the sort of railway, which is this is how you engage in a museum. This is how an artist will engage you. Um, and it takes us to a place where I am in a space that is dedicated to this work with other human beings. Let us see if we have the courage enough to be honest with each other. Yeah. So performances, and they're always different, Yona. They're always different. Mm. That, that, I, oh, go ahead. 
I remember you were talking about the first time we were able to converse, Vanessa, about seeing your power figures in the world before you made them. <laughs> and this idea of you're walking along and all of a sudden this amazing power figure arrives to you from around a corner as if they're coming from school or they're coming from the bus and they're just living in the world. And I wanna know if that incredible process is still the same do they still arrive to you? Or is it different every time? Have they found new ways to come to you? <laughs> oh, so we are, human beings are powerful. Um, we are, you know, the fact that you go to sleep at night and your consciousness slips into dreams, like human beings are powerful. And so the work comes to me and I come to the work in a variety of different ways. It is very, very special to have um, prescient vision of a sculpture. Um, I think about the way that, you know, being, sometimes curators talk to me about my work and they're like, so you started that thinking about this. And I was like, what if I didn't start thinking? What mm -hmm. if I began feeling? What if I began in an immersion, in a possession of love over the color purple or lavender? What if it didn't begin in an intellectual process? Can we still have a rigorous, soulful conversation, critical conversation about this work if it doesn't come from this sort of like, um, like heavy booted European idea about art history and art theory. So the work comes to me a lot of different ways. Like I said, it's very special if I see the work beforehand. And I used to not tell people that because um, I had a curator tell me, she's like, you should really watch how you talk about spirituality in your work because people think will, will think that you're hyper spiritual. And then I asked them, I said, well, what's the opposite of hyper-spiritual? Because I want to avoid that too. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I, um, so that does still happen. Yeah. What I would encourage people to do is to, um, to notice if you're having fear in your creative process mm -hmm. around how a work enters you, how you... Uh, engage in crafting your work notice if you're starting to be afraid of mm -hmm. something in your process because that fear if you um, walk that path and go through it and stay in the sort of primal true place of creating then it will take you to a new place um, and it's okay to say that I think we need to say out loud all of the ways that we're creating and the different ingredients of our process so that still happens. It's special. My ancestors are really good to me. Uh, my future ancestors are really good to me also. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, in turn, am being responsive to those sort of ig igniting moments of creativity. I um, keep that energy of that goodness of going. I hope I actually answered the question and didn't just. <laughs> you did. Off the you block. Did. You had a question, Yona. Um, just around the hand, the hand have such a presence in your poetry and also in your visual work. You know, sometimes the head is a hand. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Yona, for real. I think a lot about the soul. You know how they say, like, if you still yourself in meditation enough, you will notice the observer within you. Mm right? They, if you sink into your body, into your breath, that you will begin to be able to separate your ego eye from the eye of an original observer inside of you. And so for me, uh, you know, having a head as a hand, having hands emerge from the head, for me, it is physicalizing the real limbs of your soul and that your soul is active um in this human plane and you can move with your soul intentionally that um there is also it speaks to the recognition that you're you carry your people with you you carry um at least 500 years of your ancestors dna information coded in your body it's there if it's there what is it doing are you in communication with it are you um do you acknowledge it do you resist it is it not part of your thought spirit political process but the when i have those hands rising up in places in the sculpture it is physicalizing that presence that you carry your people with you and your soul is active it is present in this physical realm 
and then it sort of begs this place of of um you know, freedom experimenting and adventure. How is my soul present at the giant eagle when the line is super long? Is my soul present? How is my soul present? How is my soul present when I get pulled over by the police? How would my soul be present if I was in Minneapolis right now watching fires? You know, that's something that I ask myself so that I don't lose my mind and rage sometimes. Whew. How are we How are we keeping our minds? Yona, Vanessa, how have you been? because it's multi-layered right it's it's always thinking about like the human experience but then you have the experience of being you know black and a woman in this country while being a creator and an instructor and all of the things in life that kind of call for you to respond to and then you have the isolation so how are we surviving how are you guys constructing your days I've heard artists say I haven't been creating anything and it's because I realize I'm exhausted because I'm an artist in a capitalist system that drives me to produce. And so now I'm not doing anything because it's the only opportunity I have to do nothing. Mm -hmm. Some people are finding this to be incredibly rich. So how are each of you surviving mm -hmm. just the day? Depends on the day. Some, some days, um, <laughs> not doing much of anything. And then other days I'm relying on other people I need to be able to touch hug people so those would be my kids those right and then also be in communion with other artists writers just to be able to admit I'm not doing so great <laughs> you know what I mean or to listen to somebody else on the other side so yeah that's partially it's not the same for me every day Actually, it's more like a week, a weekly thing. Mm. Some weeks are the flow is there, you know, and then other weeks, not so mm. much. I'm a great BSer too. I can avoid my feelings in certain kinds of ways. So it's important for me to be in touch with people who are close to me who can spot that two seconds in, like, nah, you're not getting ready to do that. So that piece is important. Because I can cover it up. I can really finesse that. <laughs> I'm so jealous of you, Yona, because I can't cover it up to save my life. <laughs> my face gives me away every single time. No I way. challenge that. I bet you could cover it up to save your life. I bet you do cover up a lot of things to save your life every day. Mm -hmm. We it's just so integrated and so normalized in our stuff. Like we, mm. we got mad secret survival skills. Yeah, and, we do. You know, that awareness, Yona said, she like, you know, to, and I think it's so great that you said out loud that you're like, you have, you got the Cirque du Soleil of BS <laughs> capacity sometimes. You, 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 got the, you got the whole trampoline, you flipping it. Your real emotions are over here, but you're over here. Part of your BS secret Cirque du Soleil act is like, Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, I have some. I I uh, I don't lie about how I'm doing. I was at the dog <laughs> park and I had talked to somebody. How you doing? And they were like, "Oh, it's hard." I said, "You look like you're suffering." <laughs> and then they were like, "Do you talk to strangers like this?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, uh, what else we gonna do? I'm just saying, you look like you're suffering. And the lady started crying. She's like, "I am. I'm suffering." Mm -hmm. And so I uh, get called out a lot on the person, being the person in the conversation who will go right to the point of things. I'd be like, you yeah. don't, you don't love anymore, right? And they're like, <laughs> so, uh, but I, um, I'm in the garden every day. I obsessively work. I wake up, I'm in, I, I, I go to the garden every day. Like it is my new lover. Like I, I fell asleep thinking about it. I'm gonna wake up in the morning when it rains. I wake up expecting the garden to have fully grown. <laughs> overnight so i'm in the garden a lot and i'm also working in the studio and i can feel very distinctly that it's time that i'm almost finished planting the garden and it's time to return to my studio because of the visions that i'm having and the energy that i'm having around my materials so the material calls to me and so i can feel that um i go up and down like it's so perfect yona that you said it's a weekly thing i can see these weekly stretches of where my energy is 
I had a really hard time at the beginning of the week when people were sharing a lot of images of that police officer. I had a really yeah. hard time. I didn't say or didn't do anything about it. I was irritable. I snapped out on some people. I was like, this is not good for me. And I know it's not good for me, but I had to cry. I sat in the garden and I cried and I thought about all of the beautiful humans who um, be, you know, because of the failure of imagination of some of uh, the mm. citizens of the country to not be able to actually imagine our, you know, divine and brilliant fullness, our lives are taken away, like we're, we're snatched out of our bodies. Um, and so I had to spend some time actually grieving. I cried. I cried for all the people I know who died of COVID-19. Like I don't stop myself from having, you know, creating my own rituals around processing things that the world seems like they're shrugging to. So I, uh, I cry, I cry, I dance. Mm -hmm. I have a successful relationship with cannabis, which is also helpful. Um, and I fast during the day mm -hmm. and I drink a lot of water. And so mm -hmm. that makes me to be able to hear my body. And my girlfriend is really sweet to me. And honestly, having some sweetness, having seen my girlfriend's beautiful, sweet black face look at me, and ask me about the garden and listen. My girlfriend listens to me rant about so much stuff. <laughs> so, no, for real, she is so patient. Mm -hmm. She is so patient. Sometimes I look at her and I can just see her, you know, which is such an act of love, you know, that she just receives all these things that I say. And she might say one simple thing back. Um, but I'm so fortunate to have that relation, my relationship with my girlfriend, because she has to hear me because I'm, um, I'm so sensitive and I'm an empath. And so sometimes I just have to say, I have to tell her, I saw this thing this morning. Like I saw, you know, a man punching out a woman through the window of a car. It felt like this. And, you know, she carries a lot of stuff with me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vanessa. Oh, you are so welcome. And so we have uh, one minute or so. If you guys have anything coming up you want people to look out for, uh, Yona, if you're doing any online workshops, Vanessa, if you have any other like Zoom or digital events coming up, anything you want people to, anywhere you want people to meet you. Okay. Um, no workshops just yet, but there's a piece. It's a, it's a part of a exhibition for the Three Rivers Arts Festival. They're doing a lot of Pittsburgh artists making maps mm -hmm. from around the city. So I did one of the North Side and it's kind of an homage to my friend, Joel Diaz Porter, AKA DJ Renegade, who's from Pittsburgh. And it's like a little love letter to my North Side neighborhood. So definitely people can go check that out online. It'll be on the Three Rivers Arts website. Vanessa? Um, so I have other things coming up. I don't have links for them yet. So just check it, check for it on Instagram, check for it on my Facebook. Um, my Instagram is at Vanessa L. German and my Facebook is Vanessa German with a picture of a black girl who looks like me. If it's not this black face, it's not me. It's another Vanessa German. So I have <laughs> So this, we might be over a little, because I think this is a, an important question, um, because you both are so good at gracing with insight. So the last question before we, I say thank you to you and go, it's when you see the inhumane treatment coverage on the news, are you inspired immediately or do you ruminate on your feelings before you start to uh, write about or create something out of your feelings about it? Mm. It usually takes me time, like I have people like Vanessa, I can process with, like that needs to happen right away, immediately, talking, whatever, texting, that type of thing. And then later, for me, it shows up in the work. And that's fine with me, like, yeah, it's later, typically, typically, not always, but yeah. So in this moment, that's how it feels. Me talking about that with people 
and I know it's going to work its way into the work later. So I feel things very deeply. Um, and it is very difficult to, um, one, I'm not going to perform my response for social media. I'm not going to be like, mm -hmm. you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so in my internal process, I will speak about George Floyd. So in my internal process, one of the things that I do is I acknowledge uh, his beauty. I look at the picture of him and I say, that's a beautiful man. Look at that beautiful, broad, black man nose. I, I bet ladies always flirted with him. I bet, you know, and so I sort of bring him back to life mm. with like beauty and grace in my mind, which allows me to come to the cliff of grief, which is why was that snatched? Mm. Did he get a chance to listen to Bill Withers one last time? Did he get a chance to, so I will go and I sort of reconstruct in my imagination, the life of his heart and the life of that. And then uh, sometimes I won't address it directly. I'll write around it. So in that writing somebody mentioned earlier, I talk about how all of these different trees remember the ending of America. And mm -hmm. one of the trees memory of the ending of America is America ended on a Thursday night in Minneapolis flames. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not gonna say anything else. You can reconstruct, oh, America ended in 99 years? America, you know, like you could go, you could go, you, it's a bit an internal adventure for whoever reads that. Um, but I have to acknowledge, part of what I have to do is acknowledge the deep, deep beauty of the human beings that we're losing so that I can acknowledge it in the eyes of the living human beings around me, how much love is inside of you, how much um brilliance exists in the technology of your heart mm. and so that in my living relationships with all the human beings who sit on the bus stop at the you know in front of the art house that i see everywhere i bring the love and the brilliance and the enormity of the beauty that is the lives that we have lost into my daily interactions mm. right i want my daily interactions to be love affairs of the grace and the beauty and the wholeness of our humanity and every death, uh, re, uh, every death fills the well of the living beauty that I'm able to activate in sort of love affairs of eye contact and daily greeting. Uh, that's what that does and teaches to and into me. Mm -hmm. Thank you both yeah. so much. I'm getting from Sydney that we are getting countless thank yous and I love yous and like messages of appreciation. Thank you guys for your vulnerability. Will you what? ask to you shot some of them if that's possible? Oh, shout out names? No, to just screenshot them so we can see them afterwards so that I can feel it in my heart. So that sure. I can see them. I'll let Sydney know to screenshot. I'm typing right now. This is technology. Um, we can hear you typing. <laughs> you're like, we can hear you typing. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for your vulnerability, your honesty, um, and your generosity in this space. It was an honor to begin Lit Fridays with you both. You. you guys have really set the bar extremely <laughs> high. People are going to have to come here really with learning, like something for everybody to learn, because I learned so much every single time every single time and i thank appreciate you both thank you thank, thank you for hosting us. thank you janice thank you disha thanks yeah. janice thanks thank disha thanks sydney vanessa thanks. i love you i love you so much all right bye bye, bye.